bicentenary of the City and Guilds College within the Imperial College of Science and Technology was celebrated during the week of the 25th of February to the 1st of March 1985. It was a commemoration by the college of 100 years of advanced education in the industrial application of science and technology. Yet still more, it was a time to contemplate the opportunities offered by the next hundred years and the approaching new millennium. The centenary week was the culmination of months of concentrated effort, planning and organisation. By the morning of Monday the 25th, work is already far advanced on perhaps the most ambitious project, the construction of a large exhibition, Technology 2000. The exhibition is designed to show some 100 examples of the latest research and inventions of the departments and interdisciplinary centres within City and Guilds College. Already, the basic structure of the exhibition has transformed the junior common room in which it has been erected, and as the day progresses, more and more final touches are added, exhibition panels hung in place, video equipment installed, and exhibits brought over from laboratories and in an atmosphere of frenetic activity, Technology 2000 takes on its final form. By Tuesday morning, the exhibition is practically ready. Panels are given a last clean, spare documentary handouts are placed out of sight, and everyone prepares for the afternoon rehearsal of the opening ceremony and tour of the exhibition. But meanwhile, across London, in the majestic interior of the Guildhall, a different set of last-minute preparations are underway. The centenary banquet is due to be held here in only a few hours and places have to be set, glasses polished and food prepared for each of the 670 guests. Among these guests will be His Royal Highness the Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, the Right Honourable the Lord Mayor of London and the Lady Mayoress, masters or representatives of the 12 founding city livery companies, the chairman of the City and Guilds of London Institute, as well as a large number of old Centralians and governors, staff and students of the college. By a quarter to eight, the orchestra of the Coldstream Guards are tuning up, and as the guests assemble in adjoining chambers, 200 candles are lit in preparation for their arrival. Then, with everything ready, the doors are opened and the evening's proceedings commence.
Your Royal Highness, Aldermen, Sheriffs, my Lords, Ladies and Gentlemen, pray silence for the Dean. My Lord Mayor, Your Royal Highness, my Lords, Ladies and Gentlemen, I have to confirm what many of you will know, that unfortunately the Rector of Imperial College, Lord Flowers, is not well enough to be with us this evening. I spoke to him today and he asked me to impress upon you that he very much regretted that he could not be present on this important occasion for the college. I'm sure we all wish him a speedy return to complete good health. Yeah. Lady Flowers is happily with us this evening. For almost two hours throughout the banquet, the orchestra plays in the background. And then, as the port is being handed round, the Toastmaster raises his gavel. the sheriffs and the corporation of the City of London. The Lord Mayor. Alderman, Sheriffs, ladies and gentlemen, Dean, thank you very much for proposing the civic toast and for all of you rising to it. I have to admit, standing up here amongst such a distinguished gathering, and suddenly I'm becoming terribly self-conscious. Lord Mayors and Sheriffs get to wear all these fancy frills whereas royal princes come in black tie. <laughs> I get lectures from the mansion house plateman if I'm careless enough to drip whatever it is on this chain of office. And a dreadful telling off from the laundress, and I didn't say Lady Mayoress, <laughs> if I get sauce on my lace ruff. Life is terribly unfair. Although I may envy you tonight, Your Royal Highness, my sympathy will go out to you at the next ceremony of the Garter. It is a great pleasure to welcome you to the Guildhall for this City and Guilds College Centenary Banquet. It is fitting that you should celebrate this in a place after a hundred years of your existence and achievement. We wouldn't have wanted you to hold it anywhere else. There's always been a close affinity between the college and the mayoralty, between the college and the livery companies, and how nice it is to see so many masters and representatives of the livery companies here this evening. I count it a privilege now to propose the toast of the college and to its centenary. The toast is the college. Pray silence for the Dean of the City and Guilds College, 
Professor B. McA. Sayers, the Dean. <clears throat> My Lord Mayor, Your Royal Highness, my Lords, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I think it was Agatha Christie who was married to an archaeologist, and she used to say it was a very fine thing to be the wife of an archaeologist because the older you get, the more interested in you he becomes. <laughs> and it's very satisfying to see from the size of this most distinguished gathering that the City and Girls College is already old enough to be interesting and not only to an archaeologist. I must respond, my Lord Mayor, to your toast by thanking you on behalf of the college for your kind words and good wishes for the future. We do value our historical and recently renewing leaks with the city very greatly indeed. Our historical links are in fact very well represented here this evening. And to start at the highest level, our history does have connections with Prince Albert, the Prince Consort, but more directly with the Prince of Wales in 1884, who, as president of the City and Guilds of London Institute, opened the Waterhouse Building in Exhibition Road. More recently, and a number of royal occasions later, uh, you, sir, presided at a ceremony in 1962 when our rebuilding program was getting into its stride. And of course, we take the greatest possible satisfaction in the mark of special interest indicated by your presence with us tonight. <clears throat> Gratifyingly, the founding livery companies who have continued uh, to support the college generously in various ways are all represented uh, here with us in the Guildhall. It's a particularly happy fact that the representative of the Mercer's Company is Lord Selborne because his great-great-grandfather uh, played a leading role in establishing the City and Guilds College. The site on which the Waterhouse building was built was provided by the Royal Commissioners for the Exhibition of 1851 the present chairman of the Royal Commissioners, Sir Richard Way, and our landlord uh, is uh, here with us this evening. And not only our landlord, but also our paymaster, the University Grants Committee, in the person of its chairman, Sir Peter Swinnerton Dyer. Well, I'm pleased to have the opportunity to welcome many other friends and benefactors from academic life, from the institutions, from industry, and the city. We have a representation of former deans and pro-rectors as well, but it is sad that my predecessor as dean, uh, Henry Savastovsky, was not spared to see this culmination of the arrangements which he initiated. But his family is here. Reaching right back to the 1880s, I found that our first professor came to us direct from the Imperial College of Engineering in Tokyo. How things change. And if I may just mention one name from the post-war era, that of Dennis Garbor. He was professor of electron physics in my old department, electrical engineering. He was the first engineer to be awarded the Nobel Prize, in his case for holography, but equally well known for his work on technological forecasting that was taken up by the Club of Rome, and famous in the college for his remark, when I went in to be examined for my doctorate, my examiners were shaking in their shoes. <laughs> well, turning now from historical anecdotes, I wonder what the Dean's report on the City and Guilds College in 1985 should mention. Well, what about the campus itself? Well, of the South, K South Kensington campus, a latter day Mrs. Malaprop is supposed to have said, I always used to enjoy a stroll through the university compost. <laughs> <laughs> but in fact, uh, to be fair, since the building work stopped, it's really very pleasant there. <laughs> it's still hard to get into the college. The competition's fierce for entry, and the courses are still very tough. I have an interesting little story about this. 
concerns a student at the end of his second year. He'd done very well in most of his examinations. He'd done a very good uh, individual project, but he was in fact a few marks down on one of his papers, and he was not likely to go through to the final year. And the professor was being very firm, but the student was arguing about his meritorious performance in other subjects, about his application and dedication, about his efforts for the union and the rugby club and the boat club and the Morphy race and so on, and finally pleading for these extra few marks that would allow him to go on. And ultimately the professor said to him, well look, you're a sporting young man, I'll give you a sporting chance. One of my eyes is a glass eye. Well, to the student, I didn't know that. Well, it is. If you can tell me which one it is, then you can have your marks and you can pass. So the student looked at this eye and he looked at that one and looked at this one. Finally he said, it's that one. The professor said, yes, you've got your marks, you've passed, but tell me, how did you know? The student said, I thought I saw a gleam of human kindness in it. <laughs> So, the history of the City and Guilds College so far has now solidified into a book. And I have here copy number one, specially bound, and I hope, sir, that you will be gracious enough to accept it as a memento of the occasion and as a token of appreciation of your continuing interest in the City and Guilds College. To my steering committee and to all those who have contributed generously by their effort or by donation, including the city companies and the old Centralians, my thanks and those of the college. To our guests this evening, I thank you for your presence and for your sustained interest in and support of the college. I trust that during the next hundred years, the City and Guilds College will be as productive as during the last and as, as interesting to those looking in from the outside. I must now call upon old Centralians, past and present students, past and present members of staff of the City and Guilds College, now to be upstanding and join me in toasting the health of our guests. Our guests. His Royal Highness, the Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. Mr. Dean, Lord Mayor, and ladies and gentlemen, well, I'm quite sure that all your guests are most grateful for your welcome and for your hospitality this evening. Now, it's always a bit dangerous uh, trying to answer for others. But on this occasion, I'm more than usually confident in saying that they are all delighted to have been invited to help you celebrate the centenary of the City and Guilds College. I think we're all very much on your side. Certainly all the old Centralians are. In fact, I would guess that uh, many of your guests are lineal descendants in office of the founders of the college. In my case, I'm currently president of the City and Guilds of London Institute, which of course was responsible for the founding in 1884 of the Central Institute, the forerunner of the college. And come to think of it, I'm also past prime warden of one of the great livery companies. And although I can't be claim to be a descendant of the Prince of Wales who laid the foundation stone, I can claim to have been descended from his father. <laughs> and I'm also father of his descendant, the present Prince of Wales. 
And you also mentioned the commission for the 1851 exhibition. Well, guess what? I'm president of that as well. <laughs> I've come to the conclusion that the purposes of this plurality is uh, so that all the chairmen can do as they please without any fear of interference. <laughs> I think that the founders of the City and Guilds College undoubtedly had the right idea and their diagnosis of the situation is just as relevant today. But it would be a serious mistake to imagine that the lack of opportunities for technical and management education and training is the sole or even the most significant cause of our industrial decline. It would be a miracle if any wealth-creating system could withstand the onslaught of public antipathy, neglect, and exploitation for nearly 40 years and still be sufficiently resilient to cope with the aggressive competition of other industrialized countries. I think the, the remarkable thing is, the remarkable thing is that in spite of all this, British industry managed to grow by about three and a half percent last year. However, the important point tonight is to salute the founders of the City and Guilds College and to recognize that their appreciation of the importance of manufacturing industry to the welfare of this country and all its people and their recognition of the vital contribution that engineers make to our economic and social well-being is as valid today as it was 100 years ago. Following on the pomp and circumstance of the night before, Wednesday dawns with copies of the Times newspaper carrying a five-page special report about city and guilds. Additional reading matter for the hundreds of delegates from industry, government and commerce attending the centenary symposium in the Great Hall entitled 21st Century Technology. Back at the Technology 2000 exhibition, tension is rising in anticipation of the afternoon opening ceremony and tour of the exhibition by the Prime Minister, the Right Honourable Margaret Thatcher. But first, there is a lunchtime press preview at which invited members of the national and technical press explore the stands. Five thirty, and with everybody in their places, the Prime Minister arrives and is greeted by the Rector, Lord Flowers, and introduced to the Dean.
Before moving on to Open Technology 2000, the Prime Minister is presented with a specially bound copy of the newly published centenary history in the appropriate surroundings of an exhibition of City and Guilds College archives. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, I am always very pleased to be asked to open something scientific. First, it takes me back to my own career, the beginning of my own career, when I found great fascination both in doing research and in knowing that one might be taking part in developing things which would be of great use to the people of my generation when great new things were then underfoot and great new materials were being developed. I'm particularly glad to be back to this college. I have been here before and been through some of the research work in the labs, but also when I travel the world and go to other countries, I will frequently find, as I did comparatively recently in Hong Kong, great new electronic industries going, run by very, very able young men and women. And I say to them, but this is marvelous. You've got a new business going very quickly. It all has absolutely the latest things. Tell me, where did you train? Imperial College of Science almost always, and so really this particular college has had a very, very great output of very distinguished students who've gone the world over. Wherever I go, we need more electronic engineers, more mechanical engineers, more civil engineers, and particularly those who have an entrepreneurial spirit, who actually want to go and work in industry, who actually want to go and work on creating some of the great projects which are so much a feature of our modern life. And so this exhibition is indeed very, very timely. It's timely because it represents the first hundred years. It's timely because the need which brought the college into existence then is the need which we face as we see this very, very rapid change uh, in technology now. And it's timely for the title, Technology 2000, because as you come up, not only to the end of a century, but to the end of a millennium, you're bound to take an extra perceptive look to see whether we're getting everything right and doing it as we ought to. Now, I think that the exhibition will show not just the brilliance of the research, but the ingenuity with which it is being applied for profit for people. Let me emphasize again the profit. We only succeed in investing in the future if we make the profit with which to do it. And it's not a bad objective to enable people to make that profit, to enable people to have a higher standard of living. Indeed, I think perhaps the only final problem that we have to tackle is not the research, it's not the inventive genius, it is still how to bring those who do the research, those who do the inventions, more closely into touch with the entrepreneurs, with the bankers, very important people, bankers, how to get them ready and willing to take more risks. Because you know the city of London used to be absolutely at the forefront in taking risks, not always wanting to play safe, recognizing that if you do take risks, some will fail, not being too upset about it, but just going on and starting again. It is because you have that spirit here, and because I believe we shall find it in the exhibition, and because I know that you have very carefully selected the projects which I'm about to see, that I have, <laughs> <laughs> that I have very great pleasure in opening this exhibition, and I feel very honored in being asked to do so. Wow.
from the civil engineering stand where Mrs Thatcher viewed exhibits ranging from the protection of coastlines against erosion to flood control systems, she then meets representatives of the Department of Social and Economic Studies. Moving on to marine technology, the Prime Minister takes a keen interest in the model of the Hutton tension leg oil platform, which was installed in July 1984 and is the first of a new generation of floating oil production platforms. The concept will be further developed for exploiting oil fields already discovered in very deep water. Mrs Thatcher is then escorted to the Aeronautics Department stand, where she is shown the Optica ducted fan observation aircraft, designed by an ex-student while still at the college, as well as a wind tunnel model of the Citroen Cobalt. At the Kobler unit, she sees the Wizard pattern recognition system. It's one of the world's unique pattern recognition systems and then on to management science, where she sees exhibits representing such areas as human-computer interaction, computer-animated modeling to assist management decision-making, and color-coding computer graphics techniques. The tour then moves to the electrical engineering department stand. There, Mrs. Thatcher sees a technique for measuring blood flow using a Doppler system. Also, a unique solid-state electrochromic display. Moving to a different area of the electrical engineering exhibits, she views one of several computer-based systems. At the computer department stand, the dean is able to explain the work conducted in his own department, such as the early detection of heart disease by displaying in detail the responses of the heart to exercise testing. At mechanical engineering, the Prime Minister sees a working prototype motorcycle, the result of a collaborative design project between Imperial College and the Royal College of Art. She also sees exhibits on artificial joints, a special transmission system for small tractors, techniques for assessing the environmental effects of radioactive releases, as well as many other topics. Then, to the photographer's delight, Mrs. Thatcher experiences for herself just how light a revolutionary new bicycle is. That's great. That's lovely. That's the idea. That's fine. That's good. And if you can lift it, ma'am. Yes, I can That's lift it. I've done it quite a time. Right. It is quite light. That is remarkably light. And it gets all curled up. It's still production yet. And next, a quick look at a robotic meat processing project at the Centre for Robotics stand. The last department is chemical engineering and chemical technology. Well, we have. Having once been a research chemist herself, Mrs. Thatcher must feel somewhat at home in the final stand reserved for chemical engineering and chemical technology. There she sees a separation process for the extraction of metals and also a polymerization reactor being used to study the relationship between agitation and product properties. Just before leaving, Mrs. Thatcher takes a few moments to comment to the press about the exhibition and then, more than an hour after her arrival, the Prime Minister leaves Technology 2000 but the exhibition itself will now be open for the remainder of the week. Thursday, 
and Friday sees 140 parties of school children from all parts of the country and thousands of other guests packing in to look round the exhibition. Nearby, however, at the rector's residence, the two pro-rectors are receiving members of the diplomatic corps invited to a reception and luncheon to commemorate the centenary. His Excellency, the Ambassador of the Republic of China. Secretary to the Ambassador. His Excellency, the High Commissioner for Bangladesh. The Science Councillor for the Embassy of the Federal Republic of Germany. The 50 distinguished guests discuss, with members of staff, points of common interest and concern, all under the watchful eye of the Prince Consort, whose inspiration over a century earlier had led to the formation of the college. Later, the ambassadors will tour Technology 2000, but already hordes of school children have beaten them to it, and, in addition to the exhibition itself, are being escorted by student guides on tours round the city and guilds departments throughout the college. And so the celebratory centenary week draws to a close. Thanks to the outstanding collaborative efforts of both staff and students, each of the centenary events has been a resounding success. And at last, the Dean of the City and Guilds College can take stock of a week in which so much has been achieved. Look, I'm delighted. Right from Tuesday through to the present, it's gone splendidly. The evening of the banquet was tremendous. There was a great family feeling throughout the whole guild hall. 670 odd people, and all with a common, most agreeable sense of feeling for the college, for the history of the college, and for the centenary. The symposium worked very, very well. Everybody I've spoken to said, look, this is tremendous stuff, fascinating. We've got all sorts of new ideas. I think that's what we were aiming for. The Prime Minister's visit last evening to our Technology 2000 exhibition was really outstanding. She was very uh, enthusiastic, excited about the whole uh, display, and I think the College can take every satisfaction in the whole atmosphere has been created here. The exhibition is a splendid one, very professionally laid on. The whole tenor of the displays is right up to the minute, forward-looking. I think the college can feel absolutely delighted in its own performance. I'm very happy indeed. I think this is one of those splendid occasions, and I think it's certainly worthy of the centenary we're trying to celebrate. <laughs>